I would genuinely give anything to read this book for the first time again. Hello friends and welcome to this video. Today we will be discussing The Rage of Dragons by Evan Winter. This is my favourite book of the year. I know it's December, I know we have a month left, but this is my favourite book of the year. I doubt that anything's going to be able to usurp it. I'm so excited to talk about this novel. I loved it so much. I gave it a 5 out of 5 stars. It was phenomenal. If you haven't picked it up already, I highly recommend. This is a Zosha inspired epic fantasy novel that follows the Omehi people who have been stuck in this unwinnable war for about 200 years and it particularly focuses in on the character of Tao and all Tao wants is to just get married, settle in, not have to join the war, not have to join the fight and live a life in peace. However, all those plans just get tossed away when a situation arises that causes Tao to desire to become the greatest swordsman of all time and sets him on a path of obsessive revenge. This book was fantastic. I loved it so much. This is a debut novel. This is the first book in the Burning Quartet by Evan Winter. The rest of the books aren't out yet, unfortunately. <laughs> Um, basically for context, Evan Winter initially self-publishes, but due to a lot of acclaim on the subreddit r slash fantasy, it ended up being picked up by Orbis, Orbit Publishing, and it is now published internationally, and I'm so thankful for that fact, because I had the pleasure of reading this book. I would genuinely give anything to read this book the first time again, and I'm going to be going into depth about why that is in this video. This will be a pretty much spoiler-free review. I'm not going to go into too many details, I'm basically just going to be talking about the world building, I'm going to be talking about some of the writing and the characters in particular that I loved. I'm just sort of gushing about it because I just really 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 want to talk about it and I feel like I'm annoying my friends because I never shut up about it anymore. This was fantastic and I'm just going to get right into it because I really really want to start talking about this. So what we're going to start off talking about is the writing. Evan Winter has a fantastic writing style. It is very simplistic and yet very, very complex in the way that he sort of subtly incorporates nuance and like nuanced ideologies and nuanced ideas of identity and of sort of not discrimination as well as love and loss and grief and rage and pain. And it was so beautiful. I was too invested in the story to actually take notes while I was reading it unfortunately so I don't have any quotes to read to you today but I do just I just wanted to talk about how amazing it is. Evan Winter perfectly balances describing world and action and character all with each other and still incorporates this subtle beauty to everything he writes about without sort of stalling the plot he continually keeps this pace moving it's never slow it's never boring the pace in this book is excellent, there's always something happening, but not in a way that's overwhelming. Uh, we still get moments to breathe, we still get moments to feel invested in the characters, and the way that he constructed those characters was on a complete other level. I loved pretty much everyone in this book, even the villains I loved, I thought was so interesting. He has an ex excellent grasp of the craft and I can't comprehend how this is a debut novel because it feels like it's it feels like it's, we're 10 books into his writing style and he's now got a grasp but this is the first book he's ever published so <sighs> Winter is incredibly knowledgeable and respectful of the fantasy genre he works with a lot of tropes that are known but also in a way that he also subtly subverts them and I know from this last year that a lot of people are sort of put off by the idea of being of tropes being subverted for good reason because Game of Thrones the show if you watched it but like honestly thank god Game of Thrones got cancelled after season four imagine if that show had gone downhill like <laughs> Winter is incredibly respectful and knowledgeable of the fantasy genre. He pulls a lot from a lot of other authors, but in a way that's respectful and sort of, it harks back to a lot of old fantasy and a lot of other modern fantasy writers. And I really, really appreciated the way he looked at those ideas and those tropes and just made them into his own. There is a lot, obviously, of influence from African mythology and storytelling and stuff like that but it also incorporates 
European fantasy standards and European fantastical ideas in a very, very balanced and fan- just wonderful way. I I can't comprehend how this is. I still can't get over the fact that this is a debut. He is an expert of his craft already. And I'm just so surprised and impressed by what he's done here. A lot of things that fantasy authors tend to stumble through and get caught up on, he sort of weaves his way around and just builds upon those things and makes them original and impressive and well executed in a way that I don't see a lot. Like the fact that this book is predominantly, oh no, it's not even predominantly, this book is centered around non-white people. And I really, really appreciated the way that he still managed to discuss discrimination and prejudice and oppression in this novel and uh, it was so well done. I don't, I don't know how to talk about this without like stumbling over my own words. The plot, the characters and the world building was so refreshingly original and subverted a lot of my expectations of certain tropes that were employed and then just flipped on their heads and I really really appreciated that. I genuinely, I genuinely can't think of a single flaw that this book has. Can't, com can't think of anything. Everything was done in an almost perfect way. And the things that weren't done perfectly were sort of symptoms of this being a debut novel. Despite the fact that this genuinely doesn't feel like a debut novel, I understand that this is probably not as big of an epic fantasy as one comes to expect with a lot of modern fantasy. Like the scope of the world is not as wide, it's not a Song of Ice and Fire, Wheel of Time level of complex, but I do think that it was executed in such a phenomenal way that that doesn't really matter because what we do get of the world is so intensely described and so perfectly um conveyed to us as an audience that it doesn't really matter that it's sort of more narrowed in because the narrowing in of that focus just makes the book so much more real and more captivating the story is about revenge and about boss and it would feel weird and disingenuous to put too many characters into it and too many plot lines because that's what the story is it is about this young boy struggling to be himself and having to force all of his wants and all of his needs away so that he can get revenge and get justice for what happened to his loved ones and i think that's beautiful and i think trying to make this more expansive or whatever would just ruin that the beauty of that message and the beauty of that plot line. Let's talk about the world building. So for those of you who don't know, I'm a very much a stickler for world building and fantasy or just in sci-fi or anything that's not grounded in our reality. And if that isn't, if world building isn't executed well, I tend to not enjoy a book, which is seen as my strong dislike for the book Surf Into Dove by Shelby Maharan. I thought that book was lazy in its world building. I thought it was it's just frustratingly not good because of how poorly the world building was executed. However, I did not feel that way about this book. The world building in this is chef's kiss phenomenal. Basically, as I've said, the story focuses on the Amehi people and their culture and the strength of behind the way that their people and their society was built is fantastic. The Omehi people are separated into two castes with like different subcastes underneath. There's the nobles and the lessers. And obviously the nobles are the superior people. They are stronger, they are quicker, they are more adept at combat. They tend to have more, they have more privilege in life. Whereas the lessers are lesser, <laughs> obviously. Like they are weaker, they are not as fast, they are not as adept in combat, stuff like that. I just thought that the structure and the dynamic between those two casts was excellently done. I know that there's sort of a trope in a lot of fantasy where those those two casts exist in some way or another. There's always like a noble and a lesser cast or whatever, but they were just given different names. Um, so this could have fallen into the trope of being like, oh, look at this guy, obviously he's better. But like, But look at this sad underdog. Of course, like there's... A he's not going to get anywhere but then he does because he's special that doesn't happen in this book it could have happened if evan winter wasn't as good of a writer as he is but because he's fantastic and he knows what he's doing i really really liked how 
he t like made that discussion about discrimination and prejudice and oppression and incorporated it into the story but didn't give like a this is the solution to this problem this is how we fix it this is how we can sort of incorporate this into real life he just said this is the reality of what happens and it's shit <laughs> basically and then we get a story about a young boy who is a lesser and his desperate fight to be something more. The culture of the Omehi people itself is also grounded in this really, really interesting mix of patriarchy and matriarchy. Basically, the nation, like the country, the people, the culture, is run as a queendom. So the monarch is always a woman, which is really, really interesting. And in every noble family, it's the woman who runs the household. It's the woman who is in charge, which is a very interesting subversion of the normal trope of kingdoms. In a lot of other books that sort of have this idea of what if women were in power, they tend to strip men of all the other power and just like flip the, the genders on, e on, like, on each other's head, but that doesn't necessarily happen here. What happens here is that yes, women are in charge, women have the political power, and yes, the magic system is deeply ingrained in feminine power, however, there is also the underlying theme of misogyny and patriarchy because we also get men who are the only ones able to be warriors in this culture. We have men who do tend to look down on women who don't have magic and don't have power as lesser. We have men who abuse their power over women and who assault women and such. And that's really interesting. I really appreciated that the dynamic between patriarchy and matriarchy wasn't just as shallow and surface level as a lot of other books who sort of like make a queendom exist rather than a kingdom tend to do. I really, really liked that. I think the inclusion of magic, a magic system that wholly relied on feminine power with women as the only ones who can control magic was very interesting as well because not only did it sort of give a layer of, oh, we, we have to respect these women, but also we don't have to respect all women too. I thought that was really, really interesting. And I appreciated that he didn't fall into any tropes in that sense. And it was very original in that way. So as I mentioned, the magic system in this world is grounded in feminine power and feminine strength. The only people who are able to sort of wield the magic system who are able to pull from the spirit world known as Ishigo and who can sort of control abilities and power from that place are women and they are known as gifted and they are given the title as lady gifted they are the probably my I think I'm pretty sure they're the second most powerful people in terms of like underneath like of course the queen and then like greater nobles they are on the same level so it's, it was just so interesting because the way that they explained this magic system, which I'm not going to spoil too much, is very compelling and I really, really liked that there is a level of sacrifice in every part, every ounce of this magic system. Because I think this the magic system in The Rage of Dragons straddles the line between being a hard and soft magic system in a way that I rarely see done so well. It is definitely a hybrid magic system. It pulls from like the soft sort of flexibility of soft magic systems and the more rigid rules and structures of harder magic systems. It really balances between those in a way that works very, very well. I don't feel like there's too much structure that our, that the character's ability to get out of situations is wholly reliant on the rules of the magic system. But I also don't feel like, oh, we could just pull a MacGuffin in here and save the day because that's not what happens the magic system has rules and it has sacrifices but it, it it is also flexible enough to be engaging and interesting and add another layer of possibility and spontaneity to the plot itself and i think that was done in a very very good way i really really liked that evan winter has an excellent grasp on what it's like to write an effective magic system that feels nuanced. I really appreciated that the magic system was pretty original in the way that it works. Um, I'm not going to go into too much detail, as I said, just because it's a part of the plot. It wasn't necessarily like a basic elemental magic system. It wasn't sort of like floppy and all, all over the place. It was sort of grounded in reality. And there was always, as I said, a sacrifice to be made in order to wield power, which is in itself a really good message. It's time, my friends. 
to talk about the characters. I liked everyone. They were all so interesting and well constructed. <sighs> okay, I'm just okay. Let's get into it. Let's get into it. Tao is one of the most nuanced, well realized, and complex protagonists I have ever encountered in any book, in any genre, ever. He is so wonderful. I fell in love with him so easily at the beginning of this novel. He his vulnerability, his just desire to live in peace, his selfishness to just live a life of happiness was so refreshing and so interesting to me and I just really really wanted him to be happy and I knew that something was going to go wrong because obviously this book is like 500 pages and it pained me to think about the fact that he was going to suffer and I just... Ugh. Through his relationships with his father, his childhood friends, and his romantic love interest, I got such an excellent grasp of who he is and who he was. And I think it, the best way to write a character, in my opinion, is to give them strong, powerful relationships. And Evan Winter did it perfectly in this. I knew who he was pretty much right out of the gate. I knew what he wanted. I knew what he was motivated to do. And I had an excellent grasp of his sort of like identity and what actions he would do. That love that I felt for him, this sweet young boy, did change and become more complex and more painful as the story progressed. Because as Tao progressed, as that terrible thing that shifts his identity occurred, he became so obsessed with revenge and with violence and with death that it was jarring and disturbing for someone who had seen him as like a young sweet child as he is in the beginning of the book as he sort of turns and you sort of gradually see him shift from this young perfect lovely boy who just wants love and happiness and doesn't want to disappoint his dad or his friends he becomes something else entirely and it's genuinely so painful to endure in a way that's like exquisite. Tao's desire for revenge devolves into an unhealthy and obsessive just all-consuming want in his life began to degrade his relationships both romantic and platonic. My love for him just became so difficult to process. I've never really experienced that sort of discomfort before because I loved him. I love his character. I think he's a fantastic character but watching him become less of who he was originally and become more violent and more feral and more awful <laughs> was so upsetting to me and it was really really sad but in a way that made me love the story even more. As I said it was it was viscerally painful to watch Tao go through this change and I and I kind of yearned for the young boy that we knew at the beginning of the novel as I watched him distance himself more quickly more rapidly from who he once was. Tao is an ungifted lesser at the very very bottom rung of society and every time he attempts to achieve something it is through great struggle that he does so. Nothing he does goes without an intense struggle to reach that level so every time he did achieve something it felt like a reward it felt like all his sacrifices meant something it didn't feel like those montages you get in a lot of novels where they're like, oh, I'm gonna, I'm gonna train now and I'm gonna become the best swordsman and you sort of see these little vignettes of him doing, like, the main character doing the training and stuff like that. It didn't feel like that at all. It felt, everything felt deserved and the fact that it was also at a great sacrifice of his character, it made it painful. So the achievements and the joy that you felt when you saw him reach a point where he was sort of getting rewarded for everything he sacrificed was also painful because of all he sacrificed. It was a very interesting mix and a very compelling mix and very nuanced and I don't think I've seen it done that well ever <laughs> at all. We're going to be talking about my baby girl, my sweet sweet princess Zuri. Zuri is the love interest of Tao and she is so interesting. Where Evan Winter could have just written her as a boring love interest who's just there to sort of be a love interest. He made her so nuanced and complex and made the relationship between Tao 
and herself so interesting. Zuri goes from a humble handmaiden at the beginning of the novel to someone with immense power and immense influence and the way that you see those jumps because we don't see her for a period of time in the story was just so interesting because yes she was still who she was originally but there's a change there there's a subtle shift in her ideas and her perspectives because now she is an individual in power she is an individual seen as pretty much the top of the ladder whereas Tao is right at the very bottom so they're complete juxtapositions of each other and I really really appreciated that sort of dynamic between them. I am not really a fan of romance in fantasy novels particularly when they are written by men because as much as people are going to shit on me for saying that a lot of the time the way that men write women particularly men who write fantasy is a bit degrading and honestly I don't like it. I don't like how women are always made out to be prizes I don't like the fact that they tend to be just there for some place for the protagonist to stick his dick in. But that's not the case with Zuri. Zuri is well constructed. She is just as interesting as Tao. In the beginning of the novel, there, the romance between Tao and Zuri is very innocent. It is very childlike. There is a certain sweet naivety to the way that they love each other and that the way they yearn for one another. But as the book progresses, that sort of love takes a little bit of a twist because they still yearn for each other but it also seems to take on this other meaning their relationship becomes a yearning for who they once were it zuri yearns to be the girl who she once was before finding out that she was gifted spoiler alert she's gifted um and tao sort of yearns for the simplicity of his old life before everything that traumatized him <laughs> traumatized him and before he became this sort of this young man bent on revenge and bent on sacrifice and bent on doing whatever it takes to get to the point he wanted to get to it adds another another level to all of that and I found that really interesting because not only did it develop Zuri a little bit more it added something to Tao's character it made him more real because you could see in the moments he was with Zuri that he's still that young boy and likewise you can see that she's still that young girl and even so, there's changes in them. In certain discussions they have, she has shifted a lot of her ideologies. She sort of talks more about how lessers deserve to be lessers. She's like, well, nobles are better than lessers. That's just the fact. That's that's the way it is. Which she didn't really think at the beginning of, of the novel. She was a little bit more rebellious. Their relationship sort of became a way... A method by which the two characters clung to who they once were and to their past and the things that they had lost and I found that really beautiful and painful in a glorious way. She just means so much to me and as I just loved her so much and I thought she was a beautiful beautiful character and I, I love her. I love her so much. She's so wonderful. The next character that I want to talk about is Udak. He is basically the embodiment of the bulky sort of harsh mean bully trope in a lot of fantasy he is like everything Tao is not basically he is strong he is competent in like combat he is a bit of a meathead and he's gruff and normally with novels in terms of fantasy one would expect that he's going to be the enemy for the entire book he is basically the contrast between Tao so we expect him to become sort of like an enemy and stuff like that that's not what happens. Udak's so good as a character. Evan Winter, once again, subverted my expectations and he made Udak probably one of my favourite characters I've ever encountered and he was a secondary minor character. Like, he is far more, he's far more than the brooding warrior that that trope sort of allows for the most part characters to be. He deeply, deeply cares for his friends. He is so loyal to his companions and his sword brothers and he is so willing to just sacrifice himself for them. He, while being really gruff and really intense and really hard and focused and sort of, uh, as I said, brooding, he's also so much more than that. And watching him sort of come out of his shell more and become more of a, a nuanced character throughout the novel was really, really rewarding to me because I was surprised by how much I loved him and how much I was invested in his story and how whenever a battle occurred, I was always thinking, oh my God, is, is this going to be it? Is this how Udak 
dies? Is this what? Is this how this happens? I really loved that my enjoyment of his character put me on edge and added another level of oh my god what's gonna happen what's gonna happen to these characters that i love it's not just tao it's not just zuri it's all these secondary characters that evan winter has managed to build up so well likewise the character of hadith i loved that sweet fucking asshole <laughs> he is the hadith is the only character other than zuri that has more than two brain cells throughout this entire novel it's like he only has four but it's more than everyone else does i didn't like his character i didn't like this his character at all at the beginning of the novel i thought he was boring and tropey and annoying and i didn't care for him at all but by the end he was pretty much i think one of my favorite characters of all of them i was so invested in him i got so worried when as i said like udak whenever there was a battle i was so stressed for him and i just loved it so much likewise jabari is a character that we see very briefly at the start of the novel and throughout the whole book i was just like where is he is he coming back where hello and they'd mention him and i'd be like oh is that him no ah okay and then when he did eventually reappear in the novel I, I loved him so much he's such a sweet sweet boy and again is a massive juxtaposition between Tao I found it really really interesting how all these secondary characters in some way mirrored and was a foil to Tao different parts of his identity were reflected back at him through the various characters that we encountered and I found that really really interesting particularly with Jabari Jabari is Tao's childhood best friend and their relationship was really, really compelling to me. And I also love him so much. <laughs> I love them so much. These characters make me so emotional and I can't wait to get to the next book because I just really wanna, wanna know what actually happened to them because we were left on kind of a cliffhanger at the end of the book. And I don't know what's, uh, are they okay? I don't really know. <laughs> Am I okay? No. I had a breakdown over this book. I loved it so much. I had a mental breakdown. <laughs> I've been reading this for like a month and a half because I read the first like 300 pages in a week and then I couldn't bring myself to finish it because I just didn't want it to end. And when it ended, I sobbed for like 40 minutes straight. <laughs> like I just kept crying. This was a very messy review. I'm so sorry. I was all over the place. But I really, really hope that you enjoyed this absolute disaster of chaotic energy that I was in this vid. If you haven't picked this up, please do do yourself a favor. I would genuinely give anything to read this book for the first time again. I love it so, so much. It makes me happy and agonized in ways that I can't properly articulate without getting very, very uh, emotional about it. This just, it, it was phenomenal. And if you like fantasy, highly recommend. It's fantastic. I'll never shut up about it. It's it's what it's my favorite book of the year. It's one of my favorite series of all time. It's one of my favorite books of all time. It's just wonderful. Please pick it up. Do yourself a favor. With that, thank you guys so much for watching whatever the hell this was. I hope you enjoyed it, even though I was an absolute mess throughout the video and I filmed this video like twice. I hope you really liked it. Let me know what you thought. Please, if you pick up this book, please tell me what you thought down in the comments below. I really, really want to talk about it with people. I, it's just it means so much to me be sure to dislike this video unsubscribe down below and have a great day all right see ya why is hadith the only one in this book that has any brain cells like why <laughs> they're so fucking dumb like i love them so much but they're so dumb Had us like, we need a strategy. We need to like make sure that we're not on the ground that favors the noble, blah 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 blah. And Tell's just like over there being like, Y'all hear something? This is deep. <laughs> I will never recover from this. I can't breathe through my nose. Don't cry and <laughs> the books in bed with me. It's like because <laughs> I'm like I don't wanna let it go.